I'm sitting, well, I'm not sitting next to, but we're sharing a screen together with Maurice Bernard, Sunny Corinthos of General Hospital. And of course, uh, normally, if this was not during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure Maurice and I would be sitting next to each other conducting this interview. But this is a special conversation about his new memoir, Nothing General About It, which has just entered the New York Times bestseller list at number 13 and moving up this week, which is very exciting. This book is such an emotional and powerful uh, piece of work, Maurice, because not only do you take the reader on a journey through mental health, mental illness, what you've gone through, you just also peppered in your career and life behind the scenes of General Hospital. So it really has such a wide range for the audience, I think, which is what's so great about this book. I wanted to first ask you, how was it for you actually putting this down and reliving some of the difficult events that you lived through with your bipolar disorder? How did you, how were you able to relive these for the book? I'm an open book, as you know. So that, there wasn't anything difficult about uh, delving in and talking about, because I talk about everything to anybody. Because I believe in, when you talk about it, it helps you and it helps the person you're talking to. But when I got into the audio book. Oh my God, I don't know how. When I got to the chapter of, oh man, you're gonna get me now, damn. You're gonna get me too, so we'll cry. When I got to the chapter of all, all the people in my life who have died and I wasn't able to say bye to, I cry, I couldn't go. I couldn't I couldn't go on. I was crying and the director was crying. <laughs> and then Paula and Joshua came in and I thought, okay, I, I'll get to the last chapter, which will be easy. And and then that was the meditation that I do, you know, when I go to heaven. And I cried again. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> that was a bit difficult because it just took me, it was almost like I was reading somebody else's book. And it just threw me because I, it, it, stuff started hitting me, yeah. So you kind of could separate yourself until almost right. that right. moment, right? Yeah. You know, you, um, th your father is so instrumental in your life story and the journey you went through with him. I just felt so badly for you. And I think other children have gone through something similar that you did with a father who could hit you, whatever it, it was, and then eventually finding acceptance with him. Did you find acceptance in the way? And Yeah, you know, because eventually I, I knew that he only did what he did because his father did it to him. And, and so he, my dad just never broke the chain. But when, when I did finally, you know, as a, a, when I did finally confront my dad, and he, he said, that's not abuse. And I said, uh, yeah, dad, when a little boy is looking up at a man who's six foot and is, you know, getting hit with a belt, that's abuse. He understood, he was amazing. And he said he was sorry. And it, it, it touched my heart. And it was so interesting when Max Gale came on to General Hospital to play Mike. Yeah. He, he, uh, he came in and auditioned with long hair, beard. He was just like, I said, what the heck is this guy? <laughs> this guy? And then halfway through, he, he kind of, he, he kissed me on the, on the forehead or something. But I was feeling all these feelings, auditioning with him. He leaves, I go to the wall, literally, and start crying. And Frank and everybody else in there are like, What's wrong? I said, I can't do the storyline. It's, it's too much. He goes, you're doing the storyline. <laughs> and when I left there, I thought to myself, well, if they hire Max Gale, it'll be great. If they don't, it'll be great. <laughs> and now when you go through that whole journey with him, are there, the thing that I've noticed about this entire, the book, is, you know, there were many parallels going on in your life, and then you have to go in General Hospital and act out all of these things that were called upon you to do. Um, 
And there were breaking points, obviously. Uh, one of them being when you first started on the show, which was a real pivotal moment that if it wasn't, you said for Wendy Rich and Shelley Curtis giving you the chance to continue, that was one of the scariest episodes. Yeah, because uh, two, three weeks into the gig, I started, I, I hadn't taken my medication and my lithium in like um, two and a half years or something. So it, the pressure from General Hospital got me and I quit. I said, I ain't, I'm not going back. And I went through about two weeks of really tough uh, with Paula, as you know, and, you know. <laughs> Uh, and, but Wendy and Shelly, Shelly Curtis and, and Wendy Rich, they held my hand back. They said, we'll, we'll hold his hand. And I wasn't pop. I, I was just on three weeks. It's not like if it happened now, right? You'd be like, they just believed in me. And so I went back, never forget in, in, in the, in the room with Shelly Curtis, I was crying. I'm crying all the time. <laughs> and I said to her, I can't do it. I can't, I can't remember a line. I can't remember a word. And she said, we'll, we'll take it word by word if we have to. And so I went upstairs and did it. And it was woo, tough. You had you know, the story with Paula is such an amazing story, what you've gone through together and stuck through together. And there was a times you pointed out about the womanizing self and Paula was upset that you'd be kissing ladies and the audition and all the different things you went through and yeah. the threatening her and, and her never really leaving your side. Um, it's quite a relationship. Did you know back when you first met, we met her in a mall, right? In a store in a mall? Met her in a mall. She was uh, real young, <laughs> and uh, and but then I asked her out about a year later, and uh, she was seventeen. I was twenty-two, and we started living together right away because her family, very dysfunctional family, drugs. Yeah. So we we started living together, and but. It, it wasn't for me love right away. It took a while, but I did care about her a great deal. And I knew that she was a great woman. She just hadn't blossomed yet. <laughs> and you put it through hell. I'm still putting her through hell. <laughs> but one of the, one of the really, um, emotional parts of your story is when Paula got sick. Paula oh. got sick. And, and I, I was so touching because here you were like, that was setting you into a bit of a spiral, I believe in the book where yeah. you would there, lose her. Yeah, I was supposed to do a film in New York and <laughs> they, they wanted to do a whole movie in a day. And I started working on this, I was the lead, and I had like a hundred pages of just me talking. They, they thought that I was the only one that could do it. But the problem was that in, the, I don't know if they researched, because anxiety got me. So I had to quit that job, and that was a lot of pressure. Then right away, Paula got thyroid cancer, so I was done. I thought that, you know, I, I already had Paula in a coffin. That's how, how my mind works. But like everything else with mental health, you, you overcome it, you get through it. And you, you know, you gotta, sometimes you gotta go through hell and the lights at the end of the tunnel, you know what I mean? When you're going through what you went through, did you think you would get through it while you were, I mean, where were you in the middle of your, let's say. Uh, you don't, you, you don't think you, you, that's the thing. You don't think you're going to get through it. Yeah. And then, you, you know, Paula would have to help me get through it. She would literally help me get through it. And the then, thing, yeah. then my, my, the strength that I have inside, because I'm, I have two sides to me, a fragile side, very fragile and a very strong side. 
So I have to look for the, when I'm in that fragile place, I have to go find that strong side of me. And sometimes it takes a while and sometimes it's very difficult. But once you find that other side that's strong, it could overpower the other side. I know that after you won San Francisco's most watchable man, <laughs> 1985, right? Something like that, yeah. So you were in this competition, right? Yeah. I was in the most watchable man in Contra Costa. <laughs> right. Second place or third place. And then I was in the most watchable man in San Francisco and I won. Then I was in the most watchable man in America. <laughs> I won. <laughs> but that's when you found yourself, this was the hardest thing was the, the breakdown and being institutionalized at a young age. Yeah. That was the hardest part for me to read about you. Yeah, that, that was, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to go through in my life. It, you, you, you're, you're tied down to a bed in, in a room with four walls and you don't understand what's wrong with you. And then there's other people in there that are a lot worse off than you are. It, it's, it, it literally is one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> I know you wrote that in the book too, right? Yeah. And uh, all I wanted to do is get out every day, every day, just get out, get out. But they wouldn't let me. And then, and then if you're a bad boy, by bad boy, I mean, when I didn't take my medication, they would throw you in a seclusion room. And that's where you're tied down and, and the whole thing. And that's, that's, that's a nightmare. That seemed to be one of the most, that was to me one of the most horrific moments um, in the book and in your life, uh, your parents were, they, did you had, did you, did they sign you? How did you, and did they sign you into the? Yeah, they brought me in and they, uh, they, they did it all. And I was, I was losing it at the, at the hospital when I was in there doing all kinds of bizarre stuff. And then, and then let me tell you, the exorcist terrorized me. It, it, that, that was no joke. When I saw The Exorcist, that I should have never seen The Exorcist. Never, because there's so many, th <laughs> there were so many things about the devil, like all the things that were part of your makeup that would happen during these episodes. I'm thinking, oh, you did not go see The Exorcist. That, 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 that would. Because it's troubling to me, The Exorcist. Just yeah. Like it, right. And I remember when they, they put me into the hospital, my brother and my dad and these two big uh, nurse guys, I was saying to my brother and my dad that I was the exorcist. They're spitting on them and doing all kinds of stuff. Billy Jack was one of your heroes, I hear. I love Billy Jack. I love Billy Jack too. So when I saw that and I was reading it, I loved Billy Jack. Tom Laughlin was Billy Jack, right? Yeah, he was. he's a damn good actor too. He was a great actor. No, underrated, but that, that movie, when, when he's like, I'm going to put my right foot with the left cheek. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like Pacino was your guy and Billy Jack, kind of, yeah. right? Bruce Lee, De Niro, Pacino, and Billy Jack were my guy. Charles Bronson a little bit too. I could see that, yeah. But uh, that's who I kind of look up, looked up to. And especially Pacino, that's who I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> and I, I remember walking in the mall <laughs> with this weird suit, not suit, like a sport jacket, buttoned all the way to here. And I was like, I thought I was Al Pacino. And I had a cigarette bud and I'd go up to girls and I'd be like, <laughs> how you doing? How you doing? And they punched you. <laughs> What the hell? But now you're now. It's so funny. There was a, a a part in the book when you first got to General Hospital, and I thought this was so interesting because they're like, "We can't hear you, Maurice. Will you talk up?" Remember, it wasn't you yeah. weren't loud, and, because that's not your style. Yeah, when I first started, I I asked Wendy Rich, "I'll take the job, but don't tell them not to ever tell me to talk louder." They did that on all my children. So, first day I, I got on the set, I'm on the 
you know, the strip joint. And I, I'm doing my mono, my monologue and the, and the director's like, we can't hear you. Can you talk louder? And I decided right there, I said, nope, I'm not doing it. And I never did it after that. I just wasn't going to do it. Because to me, that ruined my acting. And I wanted to bring a certain style. And so it worked. When did you know that you were a damn good actor? Like, at what point did you feel that? In the beginning, I wasn't good, but I had passion. And I think I, I had that drive that you just have to have. And then I just studied, studied, studied the actor studio, Howard Fine. And then at 30, when I got GH, I could actually watch myself. That's when I knew I'm good. So you were, when you were up for the part of, the Desi Arnaz thing came up and you didn't want to do it. And your dad said you'd be perfect for it. Yeah, we were eating at, at, with my agents and my dad, he brought up Desi and said, I can't play that. It's too much, it's too over the top. I'm not that kind. My dad goes, no, 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 he can do it. He can do it. He can do any role. And I'm like, dad, dad, relax. So I went in and uh, did well, and then uh, went in again, didn't do well, then went in again, didn't do well, and then the fourth time I went in, I nailed it. And then the fifth time, I got a screen test and got the job. Did you eventually come to like the role? Uh, I never, th I, I've never thought I was good in that role. And, and I know a lot of people say that they love me in the role and I'm like, I just don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is the story about, uh, you were up for the role of Tom Hanks' boyfriend in Philadelphia. Yeah. And you were in second position, which means to people that if you, you know, if first position doesn't take the part they would offer it to you. Right. So what was your, what were you were hoping, did you want that role? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that, there was a week there that I did a sitcom audition and they called my agent and said, this guy sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, so I'm hurt now. And then the movie, Philadelphia, they wanted me to audition for it. So I went in for Howard Fuhrer, this really big cast director. And I was feeling hurt and stuff, so I used it because it was a scene where they're talking about AIDS, so it had to be kind of deep. And and then Howard, when I finished, he looked at me. He says, "I'm gonna have you read Monday at Columbia. I'm gonna have you do a table read." I said, "All right." So I get there, and I'm sitting there with all these great actors—not Tom Hanks, but great actors—to doing the table read, and Jonathan Demme. And it was in Columbia. So, so happens that Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington, no, Tom Hanks and who got the role, uh, Antonio Banderas, he, uh, they were going to a party dressed as Lucy and Desi. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my goodness. So then I start going, what's the matter, honey? And they're all laughing afterwards. I thought, maybe, can I, am I gonna get this thing? And Howard Fear goes, you were, you were brilliant. And I'm like, okay, so the next morning, my agent calls and says, what did you do in there? I said, they love you. Oh. They, can't, they can't get a, we can't get an answer yet, but they love you. Well, what happens, uh, Antonio Banderas did that Madonna, documentary Truth or Dare, and they offered it to him for real low money. And he said, yeah, and I was out. But did, you ever, did you ever watch it? See Philadelphia? Yeah, it's a great film, great film. Great film. Great film. Great film. But they told, the producers told my agent that if he had said no, there you go. And yeah. then years, so then to General Hospital, you get to be part of this important HIV AIDS storyline, which is one of your favorites with Stone, with Stone yes. and Robin, and you were nominated for your first Emmy nomination yes. that year. 
Um, what can you say about that story? And what do you remember about working with Michael Sutton? Because it was another actor who you worked with and helped along. And those scenes were always so amazing. Between well, Michael was not, was in the beginning very scared, not very good. And they ended up telling him they're going to fire him, but they're going to give him a year to die because of the AIDS story. So he came to me, I remember it was in the bathroom. He said, can, can you help me be a better actor? I got a year. And I said, Michael, I'll do that for you, brother. Let's go. But you got to work your butt off. He goes, I'll work my butt off. And at the end of the year, he got an Emmy nomination, which is amazing. And it was so great when he came, he's come back to the show a few times and you guys have reconnected. Yeah. Vision. And those are always so touching. It's like you kind of go right back there as the audience. What's it like for you guys to go back into that years later? It's like, like, it's like, we, it's like he never left because we, he's kind of always the same. And I guess I'm kind of the same. And <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Noonan in San Francisco is really the guy that diagnosed you for bipolar. Which is, what, what did he mean to you looking back on that now? What did that man and, and those moments with him when you look at it now? Well, what he, what he meant to me was he gave me a, a name, a face. Because nobody would tell me what was wrong with me. I'd be, what's going on? Am I this? Then nobody. Then I remember sitting down, he's writing on a pad, and he looks up and he goes, You're manic depressive. I'm going to put you on lithium. You'll be fine. It's going to take a little while, but you'll be fine. I said, Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I'll never, ever forget him. And when now you, so many people come to you and share their story with you. I've seen it happen on social media. I've seen you in person with people. I, they come forward that you've helped me so much, Maurice, by you coming forward and talking about what, you're, what you've gone through. What has that all meant to you to be, I mean, all the organizations that you've spoken of, have spoken at and all the things, do you, do you enjoy doing that or? Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I, I always feel I can't let anybody down. So, if somebody comes up to me and they're gonna they want to talk, I'm always gonna talk. Um, any organization that wants me to do anything, I usually do it unless I'm working. And the, the state of mind that I do once a week, like church on Sunday. Every Sunday. Every yeah. Sunday. Last Sunday was the first one I kind of um, that the response from that, I read all the responses and it's the Michael, the amount of people that are living with mental illness is staggering. Staggering. They, I read 450 million people all over the world. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's, I, I, I guess it's meant to be for me to be doing this because I've been talking about it for over 30 years and I will not stop. You got to think that everything you went through and then being able to have celebrity through your yeah. love of directing, it kind of all meant to be that you think, I would think the same thing, like, I need to use my platform, you know. Yeah, we got to take, we gotta take advantage of, of uh, what we have. And, and, and by doing that, you're helping people. That's what it's all about. So you decided at one point to leave General Hospital and to write you out, they had you leave Brenda at the altar. And that was such a big moment, as were Sonny and Brenda. You wanted to leave to go off and do other things or what yeah, was I wanted, to, I wanted to go off and do other things. Uh, then I ran out of money. So I came back in after a year. Uh, but I'll never forget the scene that I had with Steve in a, in a limousine, Steve Burton. We had about a eight or nine page scene, one take. And uh, it was unreal. You don't, we don't do that anymore. No, no. Either. And how many times has Steve publicly, you know, really believes he owes everything to you, getting him to where he was as an actor? Like he, you really got him on the road to, because you took him under your yeah. way too. 
Yeah, you know, any of these young actors that I've done that with, Vanessa, Michael Sutton, Steve Burton, Brian Craig, yeah, it, it, I, I give them the push, but they, they're so driven and talented, but they don't know how yet. So I just, I just tell them the how, and then they do it, and, they, and all of them are driven. All of them are driven. You can't act and become really good without being driven. Now, you were a method actor, and I kept thinking because you were a method actor, that makes, to me, oh, God, so much harder I was feeling for you to go through things. Yeah. But it also made you how great you are. But it just, I kept thinking, like, you're, you're a method actor, and then you're dealing with mental illness. So did that make it more difficult? Well, the, the method acting, uh, one time I did a, a storyline where I was losing it, and it went on too long, and eventually Paula called GH and said, cut it, cut it. He's, he's, he's too much, it's too much. I remember literally at the end of, there was a, a scene that I'm sitting in a sofa, and I heard my mom and dad talking on the set. And they weren't there. So I said, because I, I, what happens with me is I tell people, I tell people maybe because, so I can get help, you get it? So I told like Jill, I said, I heard my mom and dad talking because subconsciously maybe I want her to say, stop this. But, and then that weekend I had a panic attack. So that's where the method and doesn't work. Yeah. You have not always been so nice to some of your co-stars which you detail in the book. And it was so, because we've talked about this before. Now, you gave Chad Duell a hard time. Yeah. Uh, Chad, I love Chad. Now he's like a son to me. But I wasn't nice to him because I liked the other guy. And so, uh, you know, it took a while to come around, maybe a couple of years, you know. <laughs> well, there's nothing more fun than the videos you two guys do on Instagram. <laughs> He's there. Uh, I, you, you guys, he, you, you love him. You like him. He's, I love, I, he's, like a, he's the, he's the funniest, the best. And I was just a jerk. And let's just put the cards on the table. I was just a jerk. But yeah. I, I learned from that, from that experience. And then with Tamara Braun, you detail too. You weren't too nice with her during that story either. Yeah, with Tamara, I just felt she didn't have my back. And. Uh, again, I was a jerk, and and uh, I shouldn't have done what I did. And I mean, I didn't do anything horrible, but it was, just wasn't nice. I just wasn't nice. And it's interesting. You were you were you were rooting for Jennifer Bransford to continue on the role once Tamara left. You like Jennifer's work? Uh, the problem with, look, I love Jennifer because Jennifer was like an animal. You never knew what was going to happen from one second to the next. And I was riveted watching that. Was she right for Carly? No. Could she do Carly? No, obviously. But I did love that kind of unpredictability. It was a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> Kept you on your toes. Yeah, it was a trip. And then Laura comes in and you weren't too, you were cool to her too, right? Yeah, I wasn't. She says I didn't. I had a cold, I wouldn't shake your hand. I did have a cold, I did <laughs> have a cold, but you know. Um, but she she made that her, whole, her own. She's great, popular, and no help from me. That was all Laura. And uh, we get along great, so it's all good. And Brian Craig was another one I read in the book, like you, you were rooting for a different actor to get it, but then Brian yeah. really won you over. Brian, when I first did my first scene with Brian, I said, oh, this guy is good. And then we, Brian came up to me and says, hey, is, can you, is there any, if you want to make me better, you, I'm right here for you. And I said, all right, all right, cool. And that's when I started working with him. And that kid can act, man. That's and what I loved, I loved when the bipolar storyline hit, you said, you have to talk faster. It's like you're on drugs when you're manic and everything 
Oh, it, it is heightened. Spit it out like M&M. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so said, like, spit it out. <laughs> I said, look, man, when you're, all, when you, when you're manic, you got to, you know, everything. Pop, 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 and, and, and you got to just spit it out like rappers, like Eminem. And he goes, okay, I got it. And he did the scenes, fantastic. And then on Dr. Oz, because you've done Oprah, Dr. Oz, you've done these shows several times. Uh, Brian surprised you with that video message. Yeah, it moved Which really was so emotional, right, for you. Yeah, I just didn't expect him to say what he said and I got emotional and um, he's a good kid. He's, a, he's very talented. Uh, with Paula and you, was it difficult talking about the relationship with her in the book and everything? And was she on board with whatever you wanted to say? Like, how did it work in the family? Was your family like, sure, dad, whatever, or how? Yeah, how nobody, you... really, nobody really cared about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the kids don't care, but Paula, there was nothing in it that she had a major problem with. She was pretty open with everything. And uh, yeah, she was very cool. And when your son was born, that I mean, that was such a, because you had girls and then you had your, your boy. Was that a game changer somehow for you? Well, you know, I was supposed to have a girl and then at the last minute they told me it was a boy. Right. Uh, which was interesting. But it was cool to have a boy and two girls. I have three girls, one adopted. Um, but I, I like having a boy. It's just, it becomes a part of you, right? It's an extension of, of you. And he's a lot like me in, in, in not so many great ways, but then, <laughs> uh, uh, but then he can act and he plays piano and it's amazing. He's amazing. So you would, would, you're fine with your kids going into show business? Uh, with Joshua, I am fine. Okay. Because you can see that that's what he's about. That's all, it's all in him. The passion, the drive, everything. When you took on the role of John Gotti, that was a role that when you were there on set, you were having issues with. The producer hated me. And I've never been in a situation where somebody hated me like that. So Gotti was hard enough. I had to age from... 23 to 60, I had to do a, uh, oh, hey, you know, this accent. And so it was very difficult. I, I, there was times I'm like, I'm out of here. I couldn't, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. But then I decided to use the producer uh, and become John Gotti all the time, like on the set. <laughs> Oh my God. So if somebody would say hi to me, I'd be like. <laughs> and you know what? The, the reality is whatever she did made me better because it took me out of being Sonny and it may not have been John Gotti, but it was a, a, a different guy that was, that was not me, which made it work. So the death and the relationship with Donna Messina that you had, which is throughout the book, she was always there to listen to you. She was always there to set you straight, it seemed, when you would have your time with her at GH. Yeah. Um, it was such a special relationship. And when you think about it, I know she passed away in December. Um, what did that mean to you when you look at now and you reflect on that to have that kind of wonderful person in your life like that that was always in your corner? Well, it's, it's uh, look, when she died, it was the first time that somebody has died that I, I didn't feel anything. I actually felt str strength. And I truly believe that it was Donna giving me the strength because I didn't really have that kind of strength before. But she was always strong. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. And when she died, I think she, 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 it, she left me that, that strength and almost saying, don't go there. 
Don't go there. It's fine. Yeah. Beautiful. So when you look at <clears throat> everything you've been through, when you look at who you are, do you, can you say to yourself, are you proud of who you are, Maurice? Are you proud of the, the person you are now? How do you feel about, because this book is such a beautiful, powerful piece of to read, um, and how you went through this and you know got to the other side of it and triumphed and overcame their obstacles and still have to deal with it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, especially after, like I said, doing the audio book, I, I, I can, you know, everything that I've been through is like, I was, I can, even I was like, <laughs> you're like what? Yeah, I know. And 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 so for that, for for my, you know. I am, it's hard for me to say I'm proud of myself. And that's kind of, a, that's kind of one of my issues, but um, I am proud of myself. You should be. I wanted to read something that you said in the acknowledgement that I thought was so beautiful. You said, of course, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have my own family. My parents had given up on me when I had my first breakdown. Mom and dad, I put you through hell for that. I'm sorry. Mom, you were the first one to really believe in me and I couldn't have gotten to where I am without your love and support. Dad, you're my idol. We may have had our differences, but I'm glad we got to the other side of that. And I wouldn't be here if you hadn't helped me out when I was down. I love you both. This book wouldn't be possible without my entire family letting me share our personal memories with strangers. So I want each of you to know how much I appreciate your understanding, the importance of telling my story, the good, bad, and ugly. Wow. I just thought that was so touching, Maurice. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I'm, you know, I take that out and just, I'm not you just reading it, but as somebody, you know, reading your story, this just touched me so much, yeah, you, you know, that you were able to do that. So now when people come up to you, what do you hope to happen now moving forward with what you like to do with mental health awareness? What do you think we need to be doing more of to help people? Because I think people don't understand it's misunderstood a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's now, I think, I think actually this uh, coronavirus has, has improved the, uh, how, the mental health, you know, in a sense that now more people are talking about it, you know, because bad things happen sometimes when you're mentally ill and bad things happen in these times so we have to start looking at that and taking it very seriously. What I want to do is become a, a motivational speaker, and I will do it because I have, it's already starting. And I want to speak all over the country on mental health, and uh, you know, kind, kind of like, uh, but not as elaborate like how they do it on Broadway. You know, like Mike Tyson, he did his, his life on the on the thing. It was very cool. Um, but I think I think uh, when I first got on Oprah, I don't think it was the time yet, because nothing really happened after that Oprah thing. It was like people really still weren't discussing mental health. Yeah. But now there's there's discussions, and I think. Uh, you know, there has to be money put into, you know, healthcare and uh, mental health care, the whole thing. There has to be, you know, there has to be a lot going on. And uh, uh, what I can do is I can speak about it and at least there's awareness and being a celebrity helps. So there you go. That's why the book is what it is. So if this book becomes a movie and you can't play yourself, who would play you? Joshua would play me. We're already writing the script. Josh, you are, I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Josh, because of the Sue who wrote the book with me is a film writer. Right. So it would be Joshua as myself. I would play my dad, so I would gain a hell of a lot of weight, and I would shave my head. And I would talk like this. You're like, Mauricio, come here. Come over here, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. But you have to be taller, right? Yeah, he's taller. I'd have to wear lifts. You have to wear lifts or stand on apple boxes. Yeah, uh, but that's already, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. Amazing, amazing. All right, Maurice, 
nothing general about it. This is such an amazing book. And you can get the audio version. You can get, right? Which you've read this, so you read the entire book. Yeah, 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 yes. The audio, look, I'm not gonna say it's better, but it's, it's, uh, it's you'll see. It, it, you know, I'm a method actor. <laughs> <laughs> so the audio version, this version, when you saw that this, when you finally saw your book in hardcover, what, did, what was your reaction? Uh, proud. Yeah. Right. I you should proud. be really proud, Maurice. You should yeah. be really proud. Thank you so much for this conversation.